So Gordon uh, is a senior scientist at NCAR uh, and has served as the head of terrestrial systems um, um, and provides is, is one of the scientists who provides the connection between um, ecological processes and the climate modeling, uh, atmospheric modeling that goes on um, and that Ankar is known so well for. Um, he has even written a textbook on this uh, topic, um, which would be highly recommended for everyone who wants to get an introduction of that like interface between ecology and, uh, and the climate. Um, and please take it away, Gordon. Your, uh, the talk he's presenting today is Reinventing Nature, Environmental Stewardship in the Age of Earth System Models. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. That was a great introduction. And it's, it's great to have this opportunity to really share my views on the importance of interdisciplinary research. You know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm an ecologist working at an atmospheric science research center. And that really has shaped my views on what interdisciplinary research is and what it can, can contribute. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, that's a theme for today. And the, um, the, uh, I, the, the title of this talk actually comes about from, um, the, from a book that was written in 2015 uh, called The Invention of Nature. The premise was that uh, Alexander von Humboldt really invented the inter interdisciplinary study of nature and Earth as a system. The idea of the book was that this really presage, presages the advent of Earth system models that we use today. And I think that's true, but if so, then it, we as scientists have sort of largely forgotten those ideas. Yes, we do have these Earth system models that combine the atmosphere and the biosphere and the hydrosphere and geosphere, but we too often talk across disciplines rather than among different disciplines. We frame our science and our models as providing boundary conditions to someone else's science or model rather than being truly integrated. So that's the premise I want to talk about the today, is that we need to reinvent this inter interdisciplinary study of, of nature. And I can start this by looking at these two different views of climate. The one on the left is sort of what's called the classic sort of blue marble view of Earth. It's if you look at Earth far, it's from space far, you see the blues of the oceans and the whites of the clouds. It's really this sort of geophysical view of the Earth. It emphasizes atmosphere physics and fluid dynamics. But of course, if you look more closely, if you can peer underneath the clouds, you're actually going to see the greens of the vegetation. And so the Emerald Planet is more of a biogeoscience perspective of, uh, of Earth. And it's really emphasizing the effects of climate, uh, our, our ecosystems on climate and atmospheric composition. And we can see this sort of biogeoscience's perspective in the evolution of our climate models. You know, in the 1990s, we were just dealing with sort of the physical representation of climate. Um, they considered the land surface, but it was really in terms of providing energy, water, and momentum fluxes to the atmosphere, and it used very simple re representations of vegetation. On the right, in the 20, by the 2010s, we had actually gotten into the Earth system perspective. It's really recognizing the biosphere, its ecology, and its biogeochemistry as central to understanding climate. And now, in addition to dealing with energy and water fluxes, the models are also considering the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, chemistry climate interactions through, for example, BVOCs and ozone and methane and aerosol. Uh, we have biomass burning. We're definitely dealing a lot with uh, land use and land cover change as an important aspect of these models in an important way in which you, we are changing climate. And so this evolution from physical climate models to earth system models really has occurred over the last 20 to 30 years. And so we put a lot of ecology in these models. We think the ecology is really important for uh, getting the climate right. But did we put the model solely, did we put this ecology into our model solely to improve our climate projections? Or is there value in the ecology itself? What I mean by that is, can you use these models to actually study, they're originally designed for climate, but can you use them to study ecology? And the answer to that, I think, is really has been a resounding yes. You know, we, the classic way that these models are used are for what we would call prediction, primarily climate, but now you're going to hear words about Earth system prediction. But it's what are these consequences of alternative social economic pathways? But then I think, and that's how these models are used a lot, primarily. But I think really what's not appreciated by them is that they're really important tools for scientific discovery identifying ecological processes that determine climate. For example, 
stomata conductance and alternative sort of parameterizations of stomata conductance. And it's really, these tools are really, really, or these models are really good at actually advancing our theory. You know, it allows the testing of, it allows us to test the generality of ecological theories at the macro scale. So we use them a lot in terms of project climate projections, but the ecological uh, utility of these models, I think is really strong for scientific discovery and for advancing theory. But what I want to point out is, yeah, you know, the, the merging of atmospheric science and ecology is not really straightforward. Yeah, you know, they have, uh, there are different cultures and different ways of doing research. And I think this picture of Paul Dirac really illustrates sort of the stereotypical view of a physicist, which is a dour looking man and sta standing in front of a, a blackboard with equations. When we go to ecologists, however, we see something really different. It's usually somebody outside in the field, collecting data, smiling, and in a very inspirational setting. So what I want to get at in this talk is that if you actually bring these two different cultures and sciences together, you can actually find a new way, new science emerges from that. And that is how the biosphere affects climate. And so that, and the idea that the biosphere is central to uh, understanding climate change. And one of the classic sort of studies of this has been to look at sort of tropical deforestation. Um, this was one of the first papers done on that in the 80s by Bob Dickinson and Ann Henderson Sellers. And what they were doing is they were looking at the effect of tropical deforestation on uh, climate and showed very easily, and the, the prevailing view now is that if you remove the tropical forest, you're actually warming the surface temperatures, you're decreasing evapotranspiration, you're decreasing precipitation. And that's what they did in the study. They ran the model, they had a climate model, they ran it once with an intact tropical forest. They ran it again in which the tropical forest was removed. And what you see is, you see a warming of surface air temperature by several degrees. The soil surface is also warming. You have a decrease in precipitation over this region and a decrease in evapotranspiration. And so this was to me one of the profound, this is a profoundly ecological study because it was showing how the uh, uh, forests are affecting the, the climate of the region. It was written in a me meteorological journal, but it's actually, to me, like an inherently ecological problem. And I think we can actually see that in my, my own work sort of actually illustrates sort of this different ways of looking at vegetation or this, the problem, whether you're approaching it from an ecological viewpoint or a, a climate viewpoint, in that, you know, I've studied the boreal forest a lot throughout my career. As a PhD student, I was developing an ecological model of the boreal forest and how it would change with climate change. And what we see on the left here is a review paper I written that talked about what are the important processes that if one is developing a global model of the boreal forest and its response to climate change, what are the processes you have to consider? But it was actually written in the viewpoint of we know what climate is and we want to see how the forests respond to that climate change. On the right, just three years after this paper, I had moved to NCAR as a postdoc. And actually at NCAR, I was exposed to a completely different view, which is, oh, gee, maybe the boreal forest is actually very important to getting climate right. And you can see it in the figure here. The snow has a very high albedo. It reflects uh, sunlight back to space. It cools the surface. The trees are darker. They're absorbing, they protrude above the snow. They're absorbing more radiation, and therefore they're warming the surface. And so this paper was written with, well, the boreal forest actually has a huge impact on our climate. Both papers have been highly cited. They're both, uh, but they're very different views of the boreal forest. One is of the ecological view. The other is that the boreal forests are a, a very important part of getting the climate problem right. But what we've seen uh, because of this research, because of these climate models and earth system models, and because we've put uh, ecological vegetation into them, we're really changing our views of uh, the importance of the biosphere. And I think one of the enduring legacy of this work is that it's really changed how we view climate. Yeah, it's really interesting. In the 1800s, there's a really large debate, both in the US and actually internationally, about whether deforestation was altering climate. There are really strong opinions and strong things said about it. But meteorology was emerging as a science at that time. And as meteorologists sought a physical understanding of climate, they rejected the notion that vegetation affects climate. And this is really shown in these quotes by Cleveland Abbey, 
who was a, uh, actually a really influential meteorologist and is recognized for his services by the American Meteorological Society. But he didn't believe that, that vegetation mattered at all. And what I would say now is we've come a long way since those statements that the biosphere doesn't matter. We now know that that's not true. And in fact, what we talk about now is we talk about the climate services of forests, whether it's tropical forests, temperate or boreal forests. We talk about carbon storage and evaporation uh, and uh, albedo influences. So what is the type of things that are actually going on next with these models? What opportunities are next? No, I just want to say that was a profound change in the way climate is viewed that the biosphere really does matter. Um, so what opportunities are next? You know, there is this idea of Earth system prediction. You're gonna hear it a lot. Our models are now called Earth system models, so we now have to do Earth system prediction. But if you look at it from a, a, a atmospheric point of view or a climate point of view, typically as the land is as perceived as a source of uh, predictability to the atmosphere, if we initialize soil or snow or vegetation, can we actually improve our predictions of weather and climate. That's how it's narrowly perceived, the land surface is narrowly perceived from an atmospheric point of view. But there's much more to that uh, than just climate. There's a lot of change going on on the land surface. There's drought, there's wildfires, there's uh, forest mortality, there's insects, in, in, insect, insects, um, and there's actually greening of the vegetation. Can we actually start using our models to predict what these changes are and how they're, why they're occurring. And so that was the premise of this review article that I had in science. And I just want to give one example of what we mean by Earth system prediction. This is an example of using our Earth system model to look at changes in net e ecosystem production. This is the net carbon uptake by, veg by the ecosystems. And we're looking at the predictability of it. What we see on the left is a temporal trend, our verification forecast in net ecosystem production. And what we're seeing in the orange or the red is actually a, a, a forecast with one year lead time. So with one year lead time, can we actually reconstruct what this, uh, this actual verification forecast? And you can see it's actually doing a pretty good job. And the correlation is fairly high. It's around 0.7 or so at one year. If we go to a two year lead time, it drops off. By three year lead time, it's much smaller. But the idea is that if you actually do these predictions, if you can initialize a model correctly, you can actually do a pretty good forecast of what carbon storage might be. And that's what we mean, I mean by Earth system prediction. Let me uh, try to quick, I'm going to run a little late or slow on this. Let me actually say, what are the challenges? So there are a lot of opportunities, I think, with these Earth system models. The challenge is really sort of this increasing model complexity. This is looking at just the number of equations that go in the land component of our model in our technical notes. This is not the number of equations in the model itself. This is just the number of equations that we report in our technical notes. And you can see over time, we've gone from less than 100 equations in our technical descriptions to well over 1,000 equations. We're adding more complexity and more processes in our model, but that does that make it better. And this, I think, is actually a really big challenge to our, these models. We've been very good at constructing the models and adding more processes. Now we do, what we need to do is we need to deconstruct these models into their fundamentals. They're these sort of fundamental processes that all these models have in them. But we differ in terms of how we implement the equations. We make choices when we put these in our models, but we're not very good at discussing these choices. They're poorly documented. And I think what we need to do is take the mystery out of our models to really understand why we get the answers we're getting. And that was the premise of this, uh, other, this modeling textbook I wrote, which is what are the, what are the um, choices we made and all the assumptions that have gone into these models. The last two things I want to, last two slides I want to end with is just we going back to this idea of interdisciplinary science. This uh, painting by Peter Brogel, the elder, has really influenced my views on uh, uh, science on this, and I actually ended up sort of using it to motivate it, another textbook. Um, this book is more like why the biosphere matters. The other textbook is how to model the biosphere. But if you look at this, uh, it's, a, it's an artistic painting. It has merit for artistic value itself, but it's also been used by ecologists in their textbooks to define the sort of the concept of a landscape. And then it's been used in climate books to talk about climate change. And in particular, this painting was uh, done in 1565. Uh, but if you look at it, the mountains are in Kuru, they're mountains in the Dutch landscape. 
And what this is, is it records Bruegel's uh, impressions of the severe winters at that time. It marked a, a period of extended colder than usual winters. And so we actually are seeing a, a record of climate change in this. So you can look at this from our, our point of view, you can look at it from a landscape ecology point of view, or you can look at it from a climate change point of view, all from the same information. And the last thing I'll just leave with, I think as we uh, uh, open it up for questions, is just this quote you know, from uh, Anton Kerner from 1888. The idea of interdisciplinary research is a really old problem. It's not new. But he, he, was a plant, uh, he was a botanist and a plant geographer, and he pointed out that at, even at that time, researchers were becoming more uh, disciplinary in their research. And he has this nice rate, narrowness too often has hubris as its consequence. And I think that's very true for, for all of our research. And I've run a little over, so let me just stop there and see if there are questions. Thank you for that, uh, Gordon. Um, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, and so people can type them in. If they're just coming in, you can type your question into the chat or you've just been listening in to Gordon. It's like the fastest typers get the first question. <laughs> Maybe while people are typing up, uh, I'll, I'll ask Gordon a question. <laughs> this is the advantage of um, having the unmute button. Um, and that is, are um, the NCAR models uh, thinking more about, uh, or the NCAR modelers thinking more about like sort of a dynamic surface? And like, so one of the things that the community surface dynamics modeling system works on is, is all these like changes in the surface itself. So changes in the coastlines, et cetera, et cetera. And is that something that is starting um, to become important? in the earth system models uh, on the global and predictive scale as well? No, uh, we, 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 can, we can deal with sort of changes in coastline in this, in uh, very sort of long time scales of like paleoclimate, for example, uh, where the orography of the continents change. Or, or one, of, one of the sort of things you have to provide to the models, where is the land, what's growing, what is the vegetation or properties of the land. Um, that, so we can change that for sort of different or orographies depending upon long paleo time, climate time scales, but there's nothing being done in terms of sort of sort of a dynamic sort of surface where you might sort of see uh, erosion along the coastlines or even flooding. Uh, we can't really move those as feet changes in, in these models at this point. The surface really, the dynamics of the surface really is in terms of just the changing vegetation. We don't even actually do, we don't even deal with erosion of soil or we don't do uh, uh, changes in sort of soil texture uh, and soil properties over time. Yeah, I think uh, Pam Sullivan's talk yesterday started like hitting upon that, like root zones and soil processes being an important like part of like how do you uh, calculate that balances to the atmosphere or the climate system again. I'll, I'll take a question, uh, I'll read out a question by Jeff. Um, he says, it's a great talk. You've been central to integrating ecological processes into models. So what are your thoughts on the integration of social processes into the next generation of ESM uh, model ensembles? Well, yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, one of the things that you know, these models have shown, you know, particularly with uh, tropical uh, deforest with deforestation, is that changing the vegetation, land use and land cover change is really important uh, feedback on climate. Um, so there's this real uh, rich history now of work going on because of that to look at how uh, forests can be managed to uh, uh, mitigate climate change. Yeah, you know, can we plant? Can we do afforestation? Can we be planting trees for sort of carbon storage? And what might be the effects of that on albedo and evapotranspiration and other things? Um, but um, that you can approach that from sort of a scenario point of view, which is if we planted trees, this is what would happen. But the alternative view, uh, way of doing it is to actually sort of make that land use decision making part of your model itself. 
so that as the climate evolves, the land use evolves in itself. That's a really hard thing to do. Uh, there, there was a lot of interest in that, I'd say, beginning like five years ago. That became a really you know, hot topic. I think people have sort of backed off from that now because it involves human decision making. and We're not quite sure how to do that. Um, there are these integrative assessment models that do that. They tend to work on very different timescales than, the, the, than what a, a climate model is capable of doing. They have different ways of sort of modeling than what the, these physically based or biologically based climate models do, which are really much process oriented models. So it's still being explored. I don't think it's actually sort of, uh, I, I thought like five years ago, it was actually gonna become a really big area, this sort of the new frontier. I think it is being done, but it's still, it's not, I think most of the modeling centers are sort of backing off of saying that that's gonna be a major part of what they do. The Department of Energy, US Department of Energy does have sort of a, a coupled model that try, does these things. We at NCAR don't have that type of a coupled model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question is uh, by Brad Murray, um, and he says, you've raised the question of whether adding many more equations increase the accuracy of the modeling a lot. Do you have a guess about the answer? Yeah, you, you know, it's a, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, it come, it's, it's going to come down to what do we mean by accuracy? Because we can sort of say, that the, the viewpoint has always been, if we put in more sort of process-rich uh, parameterizations. We're going to we're going to be more uh, we're we're increasing the authenticity of the models. We're more uh, faithfully representing processes realistically, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to reduce uncertainty in the model, or it doesn't necessarily mean we're actually going to get a, even a better answer. We're going to more faithfully reproduce the some say some temperature trend or some trend in carbon storage or something like that. Because as we add more processes, it's harder and harder to get the model to work right. And so typically, actually, I think what we're seeing now with these models is that as we add more complexity to them, the models aren't necessarily getting better in terms of reproducing some sort of observational data set. And the classic example I would have is like adding the nitrogen cycle into our carbon models. The first carbon models had no nitrogen cycle at all. And then people realized really quickly that well, nitrogen provides nitrogen availability provides a really good limit, a strong limitation to how much carbon the biosphere can uh, uh, absorb uh, in a warmer world or with higher CO2 concentrations. And so then people started putting in the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is, I'd say, high, particularly at a global scale, is highly unknown, uh, uncertain. We don't really quite know. We know sort of the basic processes, but we don't know how to mathematically represent them. And now what we're finding is everybody has a nitrogen cycle in the model, but we're getting widely different answers because we don't really quite know all the details of how to model the nitrogen cycle. We know that if we don't have it in, we're gonna overestimate how much carbon can be stored by the biosphere. But when we put it in, we're now getting really widely divergent answers among our models. So we think our models are getting better in terms of having a feedback that's important, nitrogen, but they're becoming more uncertain because we don't actually know the details and the specifics of how to do the nitrogen cycle across all the ecosystems of the world. 